Good morning again, everybody. And uh, thank you, Jody, for that great children's sermon. Um, it's uh, basically you said everything I was going to say, but since I'm, I'm, I'm have written a sermon, I'm just going to say it again in different words. Uh, but it was, it was right on about God's love for all people. And that is basically my message today. Most people do know that Jonah got swallowed by a whale. And some people know he was running away from God when that happened. If we're in the church, we might just think that everybody knows that, but you'd be surprised how little some people know about what, you know, the stories of the Bible. So some people do know that, that he was running away from God. Yet this whole story of the book of Jonah is just filled with so many more details beyond that, so many twists, so many turns that are worth retelling. So here is a very summary form, again, of the whole story of Jonah. Jonah, Jonah was an Israelite prophet, and God called him to go tell Nineveh to repent or be destroyed. Nineveh was in Assyria, which was the mortal enemy of Israel. Jonah said, no, I'm not going. I hate Ninevites. So Jonah went the opposite direction. Nineveh was in the east. Jonah got in a boat and went west. A huge storm arose. The sailors, who are really interesting in this story, if you ever, can, you can read Jonah in one sitting and take some time to read about the sailors. The sailors thought they were going to die. They figured out Jonah was the problem because he was disobeying a direct order from the God of Israel. So Jonah said, throw me overboard and the storm will stop. The sailors didn't want to do that. They didn't worship the God of Israel, but they still feared him and they still had a moral compass. So they didn't want to kill Jonah. But the storm raged and they finally decided they had no choice. They threw Jonah overboard and the storm immediately stopped. Jonah got swallowed by the whale after the storm had stopped. Jonah prayed inside the whale. After three days, the whale spit Jonah out onto a beach. And then Jonah went to Nineveh, but he still wasn't happy about it. Jonah arrived in Nineveh and delivered the shortest, most unenthusiastic sermon ever preached. Repent, or you will be destroyed. <laughs> That's how I imagine it. Whatever, repent. And the Ninevites heard the call, and they took it to heart. They all repented, from the poorest person all the way to the emperor. Even the animals repented. God was impressed and did not destroy them. This made Jonah angry because Jonah hated Nineveh and he wanted it destroyed. He knew, and he knew this was going to happen. He knew if they repented, God is merciful and God's going to be merciful and not destroy them. And here it was happening. They weren't getting destroyed. So Jonah left the city, climbed a hill, and sat down to sulk. God made the bush grow to give Jonah some shade, and Jonah was happy. This is nice, nice little bush. Then God, God made a worm kill the bush, and Jonah was sad and angry again. And then God said these famous words, You are concerned about this bush that grew and died in a day. Shouldn't I be concerned about an entire city filled with people and animals? One big moral people often take from this story is that you can't run away from God's call. And that's a good moral, though in real life, in most cases, it's really not true. In most cases, the whale does not show up to redirect people who are running away. In most cases, it seems like we can resist God's call. There are lots of people who are called by God to do one thing or another, and instead they do something else for their whole lives. No whale ever shows up to help them change direction. They just live their whole lives without answering God's call. So, you can't run away from God's call is a good moral, but it's not really the way things work for most of us. But I hear another lesson in Jonah when we look at the whole book. And the lesson is that God is the God of all people. God is the God, in fact, of all living things. The only person, the only creature in this story who does not respond to God 
is the person who thinks he has an exclusive relationship with God. And maybe that is the moral in a sentence. Nobody has an exclusive relationship with God. No country has an exclusive relationship with God. No race has an exclusive relationship with God. No gender has an exclusive relationship with God. And no species even has an exclusive relationship with God. Now, it's easy to resist that message because we like exclusive relationships. We like our marriages to be exclusive. Our spouses should not love anyone else the way they love us. We like our best friends to be exclusive. If someone is our best friend, they should not be someone else's best friend. We like our parents to love us exclusively and not love other children the same way they love us. We like to think that our relationship with God ma makes us special, but that's not how God works. God does not have exclusive relationships. In the story of Jonah, think of all the living things who respond to God. The sailors, who are not Israelites, are more faithful and obedient to God than Jonah. The whale follows, Jonah's command, follows God's commands. The violent, despised Ninevites repent. Even the emperor of Nineveh repents. Even the animals of Nineveh repent. The bush grows at God's command. The worm kills the bush at God's command. So even the worm is more faithful than Jonah. And then the very last word, word in the book is animals. God explains that of course he loves the Ninevites. If Jonah can love a bush that grew in one day, of course God loves an entire city of people and the animals, it says. Today, at the end of this election that I know many people in the congregation are feeling a, a great deal of relief about, we also know today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we live in a nation where millions of people believe that God has some kind of special relationship with God. That's clear. If it wasn't clear before, it is now. They believe that God and America are in some kind of exclusive relationship. And I don't know how to convince people that God does not work that way, that no one gets an exclusive relationship with God, that God is the God of all people, the God of the whole world, the whole earth, all living things. How do we convince people that's true? Even in the book of Jonah, we don't know if Jonah ever gets it. The book ends with God's message to Jonah. God has the last word, and we don't get to hear how Jonah responded. Did he change? Did he see the light? Or did he stay on that hill, bitter that God loves the Ninevites too? And so we don't know if we will ever be able to convince people that God is the God of all people and all creatures and all living things, but we do know that's the message. And we must not tire of sharing that message, of sharing that message with the Ninevites of the world and the Jonas of the world, to share the message that God loves all people. With, we share it with each other even. We share it with Republicans. We share it with Democrats. We need to share it with Christians and Jews and Gentiles and atheists, with people of every nation and every continent. We must share this message with every generation and even with all the animals of the earth. And the message is simply this. No one has an exclusive relationship with God. God is the God of all living things. Amen.